So. Now, Dennis Kaiser is the founding CEO at Forecast, who last year raised a five and a half million dollar funding round for their professional services automation solution, which leverages artificial intelligence to transform project management processes. So, um, Dennis, a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Now, Dennis, you have a background in management consulting with IBM. Um, so I'm curious to hear more about your journey from Big Blue to Startup CEO. When and why did you launch Forecast? Sure. Um, so yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a good question. I mean, it's quite different going from uh, you know 525,000 employees as they were at that time when I started, I think, to uh, to quite a smaller scale now with with my own firm. Um, so so just a quick background on me. I have a degree in computer science. Um, and I've been working in e-commerce for for quite some time. Um, I, uh, you know, have lived in multiple places in the world and, and ended up building, being part of a team that built a, a very successful uh, e-commerce platform called Magento Commerce. Um, and and from that ended up at IBM trying to kind of push uh, some of the smarter commerce uh, pieces in the Nordics. And during my work uh, with that, I basically ended up uh, in a situation where I managed a very large team. Uh, and the, the, the weird thing about that whole process was that the entire team was managed in a giant spreadsheet. Um, and I felt at that time, you know, uh, working for IBM, one of the biggest IT vendors in the world, that it was a little odd that, you know, we didn't have any actual product for this, but we had like a custom spreadsheet that we were like trying to access many, many people at the same time. Um, so, so that was actually part of the, the, the core idea for, for founding Forecast and uh, basically building a solution that could help not just professional service organizations, but any type of organization that, that delivers any type of knowledge work, basically. So um, to, to deliver that better and to deliver that in a you know, more efficient, less boring, uh, less manual, you know, more automation all the way around, basically. Um, so... I think, you know, looking at the market, there is a lot of uh, kind of small players and there's a lot of enterprise uh, players out there. And if you look at the mid-market, it's it's really an area that's not really been innovated on a lot uh, over the last 10, 15 years. So so from that perspective, it seemed like a, a, a good fit for us to to start looking into building something that could really kind of revolutionize for, for, the, for the middle market um, on, on how to basically run your operations and make sure you're efficient in, in the way you deliver your work and your product and your make sure you have, you know, happy team that, you know, delivers the best they can at, at all times. Cool. Now you're from Denmark and you launched your business just months after the Brexit referendum. Why did you choose London as your commercial HQ? Um, so we went through a few processes with, with our current investors. Um, we, we have a quite a large footprint globally already. Um, and decided that the the talent pool was just you know easier to find the right amounts of people with the right skill sets here in London compared to Copenhagen. So Copenhagen is a great city, you know, very livable, uh, but obviously not the same size as London. Um, and, and you know the the flight from Copenhagen to London is is manageable. Uh, the flight from New York or Silicon Valley to Copenhagen is is a little bit more troublesome. Sure. So it felt like a good natural step to to go to London and, and basically start out from there. Um, so obviously we have plans for for more hubs and, and more offices, uh, but that's something that's that's coming down the line. So you don't miss having those team lunches down at Noma. <laughs> I wish we had, had the option to have team lunches at Noma. Uh, that would have been great. Um, I've actually been told that the new burger joint they have is is pretty good, uh, but I have not tried it myself. Um, <laughs> well, move, moving on from the, the foodie story of Noma, uh, what are the biggest challenges you had to overcome as a tech entrepreneur during the pandemic? Um, I think so. So the kind of the way we build up the firm is is been uh, with a with a fairly flat hierarchy. Uh, you know, very kind of autonomous approach. So so teams are self autonomous and, and should be able to kind of make decisions and solve problems on their own. Uh, so I think from this whole pandemic perspective, it's more or less business as usual. To be honest, um, everyone you know has from the inception of the company now what four years ago. Um, 
been used to working remote at least a few days a week. Um, so, so from that perspective, we've, we've been pretty, you know, geared towards doing this, uh, without any big hiccups, obviously, you know, um, we have, you know, all this stuff that you need to do, increase cleaning, you know, all this stuff in the office. Uh, and you know, people can come if they want, if they want to, but I mean, we don't really try to force people to come into the office. I think the, the kind of general nature of work, you know, I, I read this thing this morning about Netflix basically saying that they don't believe that working from home is any good. And, you know, as soon as they can come back to the office, they'll do it. Um, I think it's just the nature of how things are moving. Like, so whether some of the big corps don't really like it, it's something that is happening. And there's a lot of successful companies that are doing remote only. Um, I think it's good to have teams that can get together if they want to, because obviously there are benefits of being together, right? In terms of collaboration and communication, that's just easier when you're sitting face to face. Uh, but I think it's inevitable that, you know, we will have working from home policies for all the companies, at least that can, especially in the knowledge working space or the tech space, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now you've built a team of around 60 people from 18 countries right. and you've got a roughly 50, 50 female, male gender split. Now, those are pretty strong diversity credentials for a tech startup. Uh, kudos for that. Um, how have you done that? Uh, so I think from the, from the inception, um, I mean, it's always been kind of my philosophy that we should find the best person for the job, right? Um, no matter kind of where they are or, 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 or what gender or, you know, ethnic, ethnicity or religion or whatever they, they, they kind of have. Um, so I think it's been kind of baked in from the start and it's, it's always been important for me to try to build a diverse workforce, especially since we're building a product that's used, uh, you know, globally. I mean, we have customers in 43 countries, I think right now, um, spread across the globe. And I think, you know, if you just build up a team of, you know, pure Brits or pure Danish people or pure whatever, it ends up being, it, it just ends up being a product that's, you know, very fit for that market that you're, you know, you're going to have some, you know, subtle bias that's going to just enable you to build for that, right? So I think if you create like this, this concept of, of diversity in, in your entire workforce and, and throughout the whole, I mean, all the way from product and inception to, to customer success and, and sales, right? Also kind of have diversity there. I think it just overall generates something that's uh, way more scalable and, and also nicer working culture. Right? I mean, no one likes working with, you know, uh, a bunch of bros eating pizza all the time, right? That's not cool. Right? But at the same time, also, no one likes to work in a in, in the opposite direction, right? So I think you know a good mix is always good. Sure. I mean, I understand as a as a philosophy, and it sounds like you've built from the very ground up with this this approach. But a lot of other companies seem to be struggling with diversity. A lot of tech businesses yep. certainly are struggling. So what are you doing? differently that has, has enabled you to build up this this um better balance i think the the starting point is the most difficult one right because it's kind of getting getting to critical mass and then once you're at critical mass that's that's when it kind of starts rolling i think right so i, I think you know in the beginning it was very challenging um especially if you're looking at just something simple as you know female versus male just like a very simple example right is that it's it's daunting being the first male in a group of ten females or the first female in a in a, in a group of ten males, right? Um, so you need to find those people that are okay with that to start, uh, and you kind of have to tell them about the vision and and what you want to do, and and then kind of cultivate it from there, right? Because as you then put more people into the team, it it starts becoming, you know, it starts kind of reinforcing itself, right? Uh, but but I I agree. I mean, it's difficult in in especially in the early days, making sure that you I find, you know, those few people that are, you know, resilient enough to kind of take whatever type of, of uh, banter you might have, whether you want to, you know, promote banter or not. But I mean, everyone has some sort of kind of internal jargon, right? Um, and, and, and then from there, kind of build it. But I think it, it's also something you have to think about in, in the way you hire people, right? So the way you write your job descriptions, right? Um, so I, I've heard this thing, I don't know if it's a rumor or what, but it, but it, it, it seems like if we just take the simple example with males versus females again, that a male has a higher tendency of applying for a job they're a little bit unqualified to actually do. 
yeah. uh, whereas females only want to apply to jobs that they feel they can kind of check all the boxes. Um, so making sure that you kind of have those considerations when you're writing your, your kind of job descriptions as well. And in yeah, I've seen, I've seen that research as well, and I'm sure that's, uh, that's, that's true. So you've, um, you've got AI as a kind of fundamental underpinning your technology. And there's a lot of people out there talking about the dangers of AI. You've got heavyweights like Elon Musk um, weighing in with, uh, with, with his views on this. Um, you've got stories about AI taking over all of our jobs and robots inheriting the earth. Now, yep. your view is that AI can actually make all of us superhuman. So why are you so optimistic about the benefits of AI for our society? So I think, uh, I think obviously coming from the outside, um, a lot of, like most people don't really know what AI means. It just sounds scary, right? And it's something you've seen in the movies and you've seen, you know, all those, you know, Terminator and, and those kinds of movies, right? Where it's like a, a really bad thing. Uh, I think uh, from that concept that people don't necessarily understand what it means, there's also the misconception that AI can do much more than it really can. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we're quite some time away from, you know, full kind of machine autonomy that can kind of think for itself and, and communicate in any way. Um, I think, I think AI and, and the way we use it, it, we use basically what we try to do is we try to use data, uh, in a way that just leverages, um, the knowledge that's in whatever system and then use that to automate some of the processes for people. Um, and, and from, you know, from our perspective, the process we try to automate are typically the processes that most people find really boring anyways. Um, and, and, you know, you know, no one's ever complained about, you know, getting a boring chore taken away from them. Right. So I think what we're trying to do is more kind of removing the chores and letting people focus on, on the things that are more interesting. Right. So, I mean, no one likes micromanaging a spreadsheet or whatever it is. Um, most people want to interact with other people or, you know, do some more creative stuff or, or things along those lines, right? Um, so, so basically our proposition is to, to remove the mundane stuff from, from people's lives. Um, and that in effect can then help people either spend more time on that or take on more work at the same time without feeling that it's, uh, you know, just being overloaded. Um, so, so very much of what we're trying to do is not just making sure people are efficient, but also making sure people don't burn out, right? Um, so I think, you know, that, definitely some philosophies and some companies that will run in that process where they just feel that they need to, you know, we will, we will kill some people on the way, but you know, as long as we get there, we're cool. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, that's, you know, maybe on the short term that works, but I think on the long term that probably doesn't work. Uh, I think if you look at some of the statistics, you'll definitely see that the productivity goes drastically down. You know, if people continuously work 80 hours a week, it's not really, you know, beneficial, honestly, to, to anyone, uh, maybe for short stints. Um, so, so the way we see it is basically we want to just leverage that to help people be more efficient, uh, without them feeling that it's something that's kind of taken over their lives. Got it. Well, I started out many, many years ago, filing bank statements and checks <laughs> exactly. in, a, in, a, in a branch of Barclays in London. Um, oh. that was automated long ago, but I can assure you, um, that was tedious. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that was probably, you know, at, at that time, you know, you needed to make some money and that was, you know, a, a job you could get, right? And, you know, to that degree, that's good. But honestly, I think the world is probably better off uh, automating that piece, for instance. Uh, I, I agree with you 100% on, on that. You're bringing back painful memories of, <laughs> of, my, of my teenage, um, my misspent <laughs> youth. Um, <laughs> uh, you chose VCs who put a value on your business that was three times less than at least one of the other offers you, you had from another VC. Yeah. I'm really intrigued by this. Why did you choose to accept such a relatively low offer? So I think that's, you know, in, in, in the world of startups, right? It's, uh, you always hear this concept about smart money versus, you know, just, you know, dumb money or just money or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, 
I think, you know, there's a, a, a time and place for both. I think um, at the stage we were, uh, where we, where we had that situation, I feel like I wanted to leverage the network and the capabilities that that firm had compared to the other ones we got. Um, I think, you know, it was very, very difficult decision, obviously. And I think, you know, every founder who's been in that situation, it's, you know, it's basically a, a decision point with, I think, no right answer. You, you, can, you can't really, you know, you can't go back after you've done it right. And it's, it's really difficult to, to think which one is the right one. But I think overall, um, I, I ultimately believe that you should surround yourself with successful people who have good networks and, and skills in what you're trying to achieve. And I think if you do that, then the money will follow. So that's, you know, that's my philosophy. You could see it the other way and say, right, if I have a lot of money, I could buy all this consulting or, you know, these extra things that I, that I couldn't do. Um, but I mean, the, I don't think, again, I don't think there's a right or wrong on this. I think that the challenge is if you had that extra money, would you spend it better or would you just spend more? Um, so would it be better to take less money and spend it more wisely and then leverage whatever network you, you got out of that instead to then accelerate further down the line, right? So it's, it's a little bit like, you know, are we looking at this in the short term or long term? Um, and, I, you know, from my perspective, we're definitely playing the long game. Um, so there's this, I think there's this common kind of thing in the media often about startups and it, it, it needs to go as fast as possible and, you know, break everything at any cost. Um, I think again, that's like like the overworking thing, right? It's it's sustainable maybe in the short run, but it's not necessarily what gives you the ultimate best outcome in my world, at least. Um, but yeah, you know, daunting decision. Uh, we did it. Um, you know, obviously, I can't say whether it was right or wrong. I'll never know. Uh, but I think from from this point in time, it looks like we made the absolute right right decision. Um, you're you're not a big fan of uh, of people who've invested in scooter businesses. <laughs> um, reaching out to you to see if they can invest in your, you know, deep tech AI project manager biz business. So what are, what are your words of wisdom for VCs who, who come from a completely different world pitching you with uh, investment propositions? <laughs> I think, um, I think it's, it's a matter of kind of looking at the, and that, I think that's a lot of, a, a thing that maybe a lot of founders forget, especially obviously you, you get excited when you get offers to for someone to invest in your business. I mean, that's, that's you know, very, very flattering, I think, right? And, and most people get a little starstruck from that. I can, I can totally relate to that. Um, I think it, from a founder perspective, at least, it's very much about making sure you find compatibility with your investors. Um, and I think if, if you are... A, an investor that has, you know, strict focus on consumer or B2B, whatever it is, right? Then, then you need to find an investor ideally that matches that kind of mindset you have. And I think just from our perspective, as you said, right, it's a, it's a very, very deep tech product we're building. Um, my connotation with the scooter business is that if you are an investor who likes investing in scooter businesses, then the philosophy of you as an investor is different from what we're trying to achieve. Um, so I'm not saying there's anything bad in, in scooter businesses that, you know, time will tell whether scooter businesses are a, actually a great business or not, who knows. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately it comes down to, do you have kind of the same goals and the same ideas and the same understanding of the problem uh, as your investor, right? So I think that the, the big mismatch comes if an investor has, you know, an idea that, you know, you can produce AI technology with the same rate as you can build a scooter in China and, you know, rent that out on, a, on an hourly or minute, minutely basis, because it's not the same thing as trying to build some really, really heavy deep tech uh, AI that requires a lot of research and will take, you know, years of, you know, trial and error uh, to get to kind of meaningful outcomes. Um, so I think that's kind of where, where, uh, where I'm, I would say, uh, you know, compatibility with me and, and Scooter VCs is typically not. <laughs> Not great. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Let's talk about the future. What are your aspirations for forecast? Um, let's, let's think about December 2023. What's your vision for the business um, by the end of that year? Uh, so obviously that's a little bit far ahead. Obviously difficult to say. Um, I think you know we have uh, very very ambitious uh, and aggressive uh, growth plans. 
Um, so if you just take 21 alone, uh, we're planning on opening two new offices uh, in, in two new geographies. Um, so in 23, we probably will have a couple more, um, if not three or four. Um, I think from our perspective, we are in this game to, to win it. Um, and everyone that joins the team are in it to win it. And they, you know, we, we tell them this when they interview, right? We're like, this is probably going to be the hardest job you'll ever get, but it will also be probably the most rewarding and the most fun job you'll ever have. Um, so that's definitely a thing we say to candidates. And obviously that's not for everyone, but for the ones that are, uh, you know, we're having a massive amount of fun. Um, so definitely in it to win it. I would say maybe that's my my short term here. <laughs> <laughs> you're in it to win it and you're a business for superhumans. So uh, um, thank you so much for joining me today, Dennis, and sharing Very your well. views on, on diversity and AI on, uh, on today's episode. Thank you so much for having me.